Praise the Lord, church. Hope everyone's doing well today. Um, just like to welcome you all back to our online service, what is week 12, I believe. I uh, just need to make a, a quick few announcements. First off, you guys should have received your Sunday school packets by now. Um, if you haven't, please let us know. Uh, we did run just a hair bit short on a few of the adult books. Um, and I promise to get those out to you guys as soon as possible. We have more on order. Um, and that's Debbie D. Hart, uh, Sam French, and Pat and Sherry. Um, if it's someone other than them on that list and you guys haven't received it, please just reach out to us and let us know. And we'll get you one as soon as possible. Uh, if you receive the wrong materials or the, the wrong age group of things for your children, also please let us know. 99% uh, sure that that everything is going good, but we sent out close to 40 different packets last week, so the chances of there being at least one mistake, you know, are possible. You know, if we, that happened, lay the blame at my feet, you know, please forgive us, but just reach out to us and we'll get you the right stuff. Now, if you guys have any prayer requests, continue to send those to cljcrequests at gmail.com. You should see that at the bottom of your screen right now. Uh, you can see all the major announcements at the beginning of these videos. As always, if you miss them, feel free to, to go back and rewind. Um, we still aren't able to pass around the fasting chart for the month of June, so please continue with the normal days that you had. And if you want to feel extra generous, throw a, another meal or two onto what you're already doing. Uh, just want to continue to let everyone know that when we're down here recording, uh, we're continuing to pray over the box and the things that the elders pray for at the end of every service, and the pastor is still reading out the names on the prayer list on a daily basis and lastly i just want to thank everyone who continues to make this possible you know those that come down and sacrifice a saturday thomas uh, jb Dwayne. you know in total it's about an 11 to 12 hour process from when we first hit record and the editing and then the uploading um i want to thank the choir for getting the, the songs together thanks to brandon and eden for uh for almost three months they've welcome me into their home regardless of what hour I've showed up and allowed me to use their internet to upload the messages for you guys. And thank you to all the church family. We appreciate all your prayers. Um, we really do appreciate those. Thank the pastor for allowing us and trusting us to do all this. And most of all, we want to thank the Lord for making this possible because not every church is blessed with the capability and the type of people willing to help out that our church is blessed with. And with all that said, let's get the show on the road. If you can take your Bibles to Mark 14, 37 through 38. Mark 14, 37 through 38. And he cometh and findeth him sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst thou not watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. If you take your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 14. But what things are gained to me, those I count a loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended, of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which were behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Today I'd like to simply title this Essential or Non-Essential. Essential or Non-Essential. Let's go to God in prayer. 
Lord, we love you. God, we praise you. Lord, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for your blessings in our church. God, thank you for keeping cancer out of the church. God, our travelers safe and our soldiers safe and our children safe. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your blessing, God. Thank you for that desire and that passion that you've given to us, Lord Jesus. God, I ask you to bless the service. God, let your word go out, God. Let lives be changed. Let hearts be prayed, God. If all it does is change one person around, God, that's all that matters, God. That's all we're down here for, Lord, is to help one person, God. God, touch your church, God. Strengthen us, God. Touch your pastors, God. And touch your leaders and your elders and your Sunday school teachers, God. And everybody in your churches, God, strengthen them. God, help us to get through this time until we can all gather around. God, touch the leaders of our nation. God, give them wisdom and knowledge and understanding, God. God, give them the right words, God. Move for them, God. Touch our doctors and our EMTs and our police officers and just everyone that's on the front line of this disease, God. Move for it, God. And you can get rid of this thing in the blink of an eye. God, I ask you, Lord, to please again, God, bless our church, God, and continue to strengthen us. And we give you all the praise and the glory for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, Jesus. Excuse me. When the government shuts down over things like the debt ceiling, like we've seen so many times in the past few years, you know, workers are classified by the government as essential or, or non-essential. Posts they see as critical for the functioning of the nation versus posts that if they go unoccupied, you know, the wheels of this country will not essentially grind to a halt right away. You know, we need the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of Homeland Security, but we can make it a few weeks if we don't have the people operating the, the panda cameras at the National Zoo in Washington. You know, nowadays you guys are probably tired of hearing that word essential. I know I kind of am myself. But, you know, for months, governments and leaders had to decide what businesses and what organizations to classify as essential or non-essential in this, you know, coronavirus pandemic. And the things, you know, they had to decide do the people need these to survive and to be able to function, or can they live without these things for a few months? You know, we need Walmart, but I think we'll be okay if we don't have a couple tattoo parlors open, you know. And a big argument back a few months ago and still, you know, hotly debated today is if religious services are considered essential or not, many governors have decided to, to keep churches closed, and, you know, as a safety concern for their people. An overwhelming majority of pastors decided anyway to, to keep their congregations and their church doors closed. And, you know, our pastor was included in that. And as of right now, he told me it's okay to say, you know, he's looking at reconsidering everything at the end of this month. But until then, we'll still be online because he cares for you guys. He cares about your safety. And he made the original call to shut down about two weeks before the governor even issued his stay-at-home order. And I can remember being over at his house almost every day and then bounce from his house to Brother Dwayne's house because, you know, he was off work at the time and trying to work up strategies of what to do if we're open or how to shift the church online, just going back and forth day after day. And I can only imagine the pain of the burden that the pastor felt about deciding, you know, if he was going to close it or not. Just looking at him, I kind of felt sorry for him. You know, you guys see him in here, and I was talking to, to Tammy Stowers this week, and she says, you know, the pastor, he's just superhuman. But, you know, in that moment, you could see, you know, he was just worried to death about that. He was just as we were. And, you know, that's a burden that me and you will never understand. But he decided to take on that for us. And so if you guys are thankful that he is concerned about your safety, please reach out to him, a phone call, Facebook message, just something to reassure him that you are still behind him. But yeah. I can remember, like I said, you know, going back and forth, and he was just, he said, I don't know what to do, and he would, you would ask him, and he would go, Phew. I'm just waiting to hear from the Lord, and I'm just waiting for to hear from the Lord, and then that one day, he called me at work, and he, he said, Johnny Lee, he said, I, I made the call, I called everybody else, you know, get things together, we're going online, and I went over to his house that evening, and I was talking to him, he says, I feel good about it, I feel like a weight has been lifted off of my shoulders, but I can remember one thing he said that stuck out, and I'll try to repeat it as best as he could. And Pastor, if you're watching and I misquote you, you know, feel free to correct me on that. But he said that he feels like now is a time of reflection for people, a time for people to examine 
their own walks with God. They can't judge themselves or justify their actions based off what other people in the church are doing or what they see other people doing to try to justify things. They can't say someone here is hindering their walk. You know, we'll have the messages up for them, but it's going to continue to be up to them on how they continue their walk. If they mess up, then they'll know who exactly is to blame. So today I ask you during this time of reflection, is church essential or non-essential to you? Is your walk with God, is your desire to get in touch with God, to feel that power, is it great enough that you won't let the fact that we can't meet in this building, will you let that hinder your walk? Or if you become accustomed and saddled into the, the, the muck and the mire and stuck in a rut that you can only feel something on Sundays when you're here, is there an excuse that's holding you back? <clears throat> excuse me, and I know we have to assemble ourselves together. You know, the Bible tells us that, and I love the fellowship that occurs. You know, I love every single person in here, and that even goes to you, David Blevins. I know you're out there watching. Um, but we have to come to church. We have to come to the building. That's what God tells us to do. But right now in this season, that's not an option. But today I'm not talking about being in the building. I'm talking about the capital C church building. And I know you guys have heard it week after week after week that the church is not limited to the building. And you might be tired of hearing about it, but it's the truth. Either way, the church is not limited to this building. Two years ago, I was experiencing exactly what you guys are going through. Missing about three months of service, but you guys were still able to come here and I had to miss out. And I was stuck laying on my face and I remember pleading with my mom and dad saying, you know, just get me to church. You know, if it's just 30 minutes of Sunday school, I just want to be there. And they would say, no, you have to focus on recovery. I would ask my nana and papa, and they would say no. And I even asked Brother Dwayne a time or two, and he said, no, you better take care of yourself. And, you know, it hurt not being here. But then that's when I had to come to the realization that just because I was separated from you guys, that I wasn't really separated Amen. from the church. So every Saturday, or every Sunday at 10 o'clock, I would turn on Brother Kenny Carpenter down at Maryville. And it may have looked funny with my head in a horseshoe-shaped pillow stuck to the edge of my bed looking down at my iPad, and I'm not going to lie, it felt a little bit funny at first. But when the praise and worship started to go, I began to feel something. And when the word came forth, I began to feel that power and conviction like I was actually sitting there in their church service with them because I'd made up in my mind that I was gonna have church. And in my bedroom right there, that's where I had it. And I don't say that stuff just to, to boast myself or say, look at me. You know, I had a choice to make, but what was driving me was something that was placed in there years and years ago, many, many years ago, on a Saturday night service before I entered seventh grade, right there where our tripod stands now, God filled me with the Holy Ghost and he put a deep desire inside of me that I just want to continue to serve him. And that time I had to choose if I wanted to keep that fire lit or if I'd let it cool down just a little bit based on my circumstances. But I thank God he put that love and that desire for him inside of me that I kept persevering no matter what happened. I stayed committed to my walk. Paul says in Philippians 3 and 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He said, I press. That means I run after. That means I pursue after. The path we're on is too important to let anything get in the way. Excuse me. Romans 8, 35 through 39 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long, and we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you're actually pressing for the mark, you're pressing toward that reward, the high calling of God. If you're committed to this thing, nothing is going to be able to separate you because through him we're more than just conquerors. But first you have to ask yourself, is serving God, is that something that is essential to my life or is it not essential? <clears throat> what is essential to you? What are your, your priorities in life? Are you really fully in 
to this thing? Are you fully committed? Because we can all talk a big game so many times, you know, we're really good at that. But when it comes time to put things into action, a lot of people disappear. It's kind of like when you go to play in the family reunion and the pastor says, it's okay to talk about your family, not your church family, but your regular family. And a lot of people want to have the reunion. A lot of people have a lot of input and a lot of opinions on how things should really happen. But when it comes time to set up everything, Amen. or if it comes time to clean up everything, you'll find that the ratio of opinion givers versus helpers is really, really unbalanced. Right. Mark 14 and 31 says, But he spake the more vehemently, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. This is when Jesus told Peter, he said, You're going to deny me three times. But Peter was adamant. He said, if I have to die, if I should die with you, I will still never deny you. No matter what it takes on. And some of the other gospels, Peter even says, I'll go to prison for you if I have to. And all the other disciples said the exact same thing. But then we skip just a few hours later in time into that evening. In Mark 14, 37 through 41. And he cometh and findeth him sleeping and saith, Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldest thou not watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he, excuse me, and again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Yeah. Neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. The disciples said, Jesus, we're all in. No matter what it takes, we're behind you. We're about the kingdom. Peter said that he would never deny Jesus. That thought would never cross his mind. But when it came time to actually stand with Jesus, how many people were actually there standing trial with him? He was by himself. and It's no wonder he asked, when the Son of Man returns, will I find faith in the earth? He knows how we are as fleshly beings. He saw his disciples argue over who was going to be greatest in the kingdom. He sees them when they promise not to abandon, abandon him. And yet he sees them unable just to watch with him. At first he didn't even say watch and pray. He just said watch. He says, guys, look out for me. But they couldn't even do that for one hour in the garden. And three times he found them asleep. And no doubt the pain that it caused him to see these people who claimed to be his friends who were letting him down. And we're guilty of the same thing sometimes. People will say church is, church is really essential to me. Church is what I'm all about. But our actions don't always show that. And I can imagine the anger <laughs> that God must feel towards us when we say things like that, but he sees our actions. You know, people say, I'm, I'm committed to church, but God's sitting there wondering, well, where are you? on Tuesday night at ladies' service? Why aren't you showing up to Wednesday at choir practice? Why are, if you want your kids involved in this, why aren't you bringing them to youth service? Why aren't you sitting down here at adult Bible study? Where are you on Saturday night service when we have more guests than we have regular church members? Are you really committed to this thing? You say that you want prayer and Bible back in the schools. Well, you've had your kids teaching them at home for three months. How many of you opened up the day with prayer or opened up the day with reading your Bible? We'll spend seven hours driving to the beach. When was the last time you spent 30 minutes praying for your pastor and the strength of the church? We'll spend six hours to go to Christiansburg to drive and go out and eat and watch a movie. But when was the last time we put that much time into praying for our lost loved ones to get them back in? You know, are the things of God really essential in your life? Or are they just like the non-essential worker? They there, they're there, they serve a purpose, but when things get hard and times get tough, you cast them to the side because you have priorities on other things. You know, parents, is it essential that you teach your children the word? Deuteronomy 11, 18 through 19 says, Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your head, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And ye shall teach them your children... Speaking of them, when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by thy way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Are you praying with your kids daily? Are you making sure they're studying the word? You know, I've been teaching Sunday school for eight years now, so I know just a couple things, but I know enough to tell you that our job is not to be their main teacher. We're there to help you. We're there to be your aid. And the main source comes from home. We get them once a week maybe for 40 minutes a week. 
In a year's time, that's less than 36 total hours. That's like a day and a half out of 365 days. They need more than that if you want them to grow, if you want them to prosper in church. You wouldn't expect them to pass high school or graduate college with just a day and a half worth of training. And I don't know if I would be up here if my parents hadn't taught me. You know, I, I didn't know things, but they helped me learn. I can remember one time, I was probably about six or seven years old, and we were leaving church. I know the, uh, the pastor of the church we were at just preached a message about, you know, people needing to be prayer warriors. And I remember pulling out of the church parking lot, and I said, boy, I don't want to ever be a prayer warrior. And my mom turned around and said, why, why would you say that? And I didn't understand. I said, well, I said, whatever, it sound, whatever they have to do, it sure just sounds like a lot of work. You know, I don't know what they're doing, but it's a lot of work. So then my parents had to explain to me the importance of why being a prayer warrior, you know, is needed in the church. And then after that, a year or two later, I can remember starting to feel the pull of God, you know, and starting to realize I needed to do more in church versus just sitting there and, you know, playing with my toys. And that I needed to get involved. And y'all forgive me if I've told the story before, but I really wanted to pray. I felt that need to pray, but I didn't know exactly what to do. So I went to my mom and I asked for help. And she grabbed my hand and said, just pray what I pray. Repeat what I repeat. And that night was when I first started learning how to really, how to pray. Because she saw that teaching me how to have a prayer life was essential in her role. Parents, please get involved with your kids. Don't just assume they're reading and they're praying on their own. Actually get in there with them and do it. The Sunday school lessons we sent out, you know, put time and put preparation in it. We do that every Sunday when we're upstairs teaching your kids. So please continue to do that when you're at home. You know, spending time with the Lord throughout the week, is that really essential to you? Or, you know, are you putting the hours of prayer in each week? Are you fasting when it hurts the most or when it's convenient? Are all these things must, absolute must in your life? We look at people like Daniel who was told not to pray, he knew the consequences of what would happen when he began to pray. Yet he never stopped. He was thrown in the lion's den, but God brought him out. He was devoted to serving God at any cost, no matter what happened. And he tells the king that God shut the lion's mouth because he found innocency or he found purity in him. Second Chronicles 16 and 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in, behalf, in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. If you want to do something for God, if you really want him to use you, then seek after him on a daily basis. Study, pray, and fast. You know, purify your heart because his eyes are constantly searching the earth. He's wanting someone that he can use and someone that he can be glorified in. And what would happen if we each just took time and set it aside each day for the Lord? And I'm talking about tithe and time, something that, that really might hurt our flesh. You know, Now, I'm a believer in God wanting us to enjoy the things that he's blessed us with, and he's given us things you know, to use that you know, we, are in, we can enjoy, and there's no problem with that. But problems arise when those things become idols to us, when they become little G gods to us, when we begin to put too much time into it. And there's nothing wrong with your kids playing sports. But when their sports start to interfere with their church attendance, that's when you have a problem. There's nothing wrong with Netflix as long as you're not watching junk. But when you put six to seven hours into that thing in one day, day after day, that's when you have a problem. And that can apply to anything, you know, that, that eats up our time. After I graduated high school, I tell my kids in Sunday school class all the time, don't be like me because I put between 700 and eight hours 800 hours into one video game. And now I look back and I'm like, Lord Jesus, what a waste of time. You know, I could have went through the Bible eight or nine times just in that year alone. But I look back and I'm like, what a waste. Because it's so easy to fall into things like that. Now we have a lot more modern technology. And if you guys have smartphones and, you know, you really feel like checking, you can go in your settings right now and see just how much you use your phone throughout the day and which apps really take up the most of your time, and I know I mentioned it last week, but people spend three, four, five hours a day just on social media, unless that's part of your job, I don't see how you can do that. But we let those things begin to take over and interfere with our lives when we could really be putting that time towards God. And if we have time to waste on all these things, then we have time 
to give back to God. You know, he gives us 24 hours every day. We can give a little bit of that time back to him. You know, I know the pastor himself gives at least 10% of his day back to the Lord through praying and studying the word. And, you know, you could just imagine what would happen in our church if we all began to do something like that. And I'm, if we just gave 5% of our day back to God, just 5%, that's roughly maybe an hour and a half, give or take. So 40 minutes in the morning and 40 minutes in the evening. Is that really too much to ask of ourselves? Because I know the flesh wants us to think that that's a heavy burden, but in the grand scheme of things, it's really not. <clears throat> and if you missed Brother Thomas's lesson last week, I really, really encourage you to go back to watch it because you'll see that the first church truly viewed this thing as essential. And not only did they give of their time, several of them gave of their lives. They gave everything they had. Stephen was stoned to death. And God forgive us if we think just an hour or two of prayer every day and reading our word is too much to handle. The apostles, the ones who we say we're supposed to be like, had priorities. They were united in their goals at Pentecost. They were in one accord. That meant they had one mind and they had one passion. They wanted the power that Jesus had promised, and God brought it down to them. I was talking to my friend uh, just the other day. We was texting back and forth, and we was talking about, you know, all the chaos that was going on right now. We began to talk about Pentecost and how, you know, all the different nationalities were represented at the first church and how there was no division, there was no hate, there was no prejudice, there was no nothing involved in that church. They all just came together, and he made a good point. He mentioned the Tower of Babel. And how when man decided to unite the first time to build a tower to heaven, God said, these people are united. And they said, nothing is going to restrain him. I have to go down there and confound them. And that's when he began to give them diverse tongues to separate the people. But on Pentecost, God saw the church united because they actually wanted to touch God Amen. for the right reason. And he began to use the tongues as he began to unite all the people and all the different nationalities and everything heard the Bible says they heard the wondrous works of God. God was being magnified in their tongues. And God united, because the church united, God blessed the church. And a lot of powerful things happen when the church unites, when it becomes as one. Unity is really a mindset. Right. Amen. You know, we can all be in the same room, but not be united. The pastor says, y'all can be sitting here in church, but your mind being out in California all the time. Right. You know, in this time, we can't gather together you know, we can still unite. We can still have one mind and one passion. And I believe God will begin to move on our needs, just like when Peter was in prison and the church began to pray continuously and God set him free. We have hundreds of names on our cancer list alone. We have names on our prayer list that have been on there for over 20 years. I can remember them as a kid, and they're still on there. And I believe that if we come together in one mind, and one accord, God could wipe out that prayer list. He could get all those names off there. And he could do things. He could heal all the children at St. Jude's and all the children at Signers. The lost loved ones that we pray for every Sunday, he could bring back in. Brother Jay Kennedy could walk again if we could all get about one mind and one accord. And some people doubt that those things can happen. But go read the book and tell me if there's anything that's impossible for the Lord. The God who spoke and there was light who told Ezekiel that those dry bones can live, that picked up Philip a two days journey after he baptized the eunuch and sent him somewhere else and preached. God can do anything, and we can attain those same things if we come in one accord. And that only happens when we're serious about this thing, when we view our walks and our relationship with God as essential. I'm beginning to wrap up here. don't want to go too long. In Haggai chapter 1, twice God says, Consider your ways. Church, you've got to consider your walk with God. Is it essential to you? And if you don't know or if you don't think so, now is that time to make that commitment to him. Now is the time for all of us, even if it is essential, to keep continuing to dig deeper because you can never dig too deep in God. We have to put more into this. There's a gospel song called Midnight, and it's kind of written from the perspective of of the Lord talking to someone, you know, who, who's crying out to him again that's in trouble. And it says, you say that you love me and can't live without me. Then why do you call me only when you need me? And that cuts a little bit deep. Don't wait 
and play around with your prayer life. Don't wait until it's too late, till you're in trouble, or it's too late for you to realize that God is essential to you. Because one day, that trumpet will sound. We've heard it for years and years. The Lord's coming back. The Lord's coming back. And he's coming back. I don't know what it is. But he better be essential to you when he comes back. You've got to realize that you can't do anything without him. I'm closing right here, Acts 17 and 28 says, For in him we live and move and have our being. He's our everything. He's all we need, church. Today you've got to decide, is God essential to you or not? Is church essential or non-essential to you or not? Is your walk essential? Is making sure your family and your lost loved ones making it in, is that essential or non-essential to you? Let's pray. Lord God, we love you, God. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, God. God, help us to realize that you are essential to our life, God, that you are everything, Lord. God, prick our hearts and convict us, God. Turn us around, God. God, plow up our fallow ground. Get all the junk that's in our life, God. Take all these distractions away from us, God. Help us to realize that you are essential, God. Lord Jesus, help us to be lights and witnesses to this world, Lord. Help us to spread your word, God, and share your gospel and your truth, Lord Jesus. Let us be effective witnesses in this world, God. I ask the Lord to continue, God, to bless our church, God, and strengthen us, God. Lead us and guide us and direct us. Touch our pastor and all our leaders. Lord Jesus, God, move them. We'll give them right words, knowledge, and words. Jesus, God, thank you again for your blessings, God, to keep the cancer out of the church, our travel are safe, and our children are safe, and just everything you've done, God. We're not worthy of everything you've done, God. God, can strengthen your people, God. Keep us united, God. Give us that mentality of God to come in one mind, one accord, that we can reach you, God, and great things can happen, Lord. God, we give you all the praise and the glory and honor for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Love you, church. Hope everyone has a good week. I really hope to see you soon.